it's great to have some wonderful Credo alumni here uh, from across the years. Christina Giles was there right at the beginning, back last millennium, <laughs> um, uh, back in 1999. Natalie followed and Karen was shortly after that. Um, these three ladies are absolutely incredibly creative. And I see in our, our midst, I see people who are composers and violinists and all other kind of cool things. Um, the typical thought is you go through music school and then you go through masters and then you start to think about how you get a job and then you get a job with some place and then you stick there for the rest of your career. But that's not really how it goes in music. Really, uh, musicians are relentlessly creative people and they can find all kinds of things they can do. Some of them even pay money. Um, <laughs> and uh, so uh, Natalie and Christina and Karen are all here tonight because they've created a dizzying array of uh, really interesting projects between them that, that they have done that have uh, you know put food on the table for their family, but they've also um, created a lot of joy and created a lot of interesting communities with that. So um, they're not necessarily models for you to follow, but I think they're inspirations um, for you to find your own talents and see what you can do with your music. You may end up playing in New York Philharmonic or you may end up creating your own career. So it's really exciting to see what they've done. And um, I'll just turn it over to Maria and she'll get us started with our panel. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, and I've been really looking forward to this all week. So I'm super excited. Um, but like we always do uh, with the fireside chats, um, feel, feel free, any of you to, if you have questions, um, write them in the chat. Um, and we usually do like a little Q&A at the end. Um, and so we'll get to those then. But um, I think we'll just first start with um, having everyone individually just introduce themselves. Um, who are you? What do you do? Um, and kind of how did you get to this point uh, with your career? So maybe we'll start with, uh, as it lays out on my screen, uh, Karen is first on that. So how about we start there? Thank you for having me. I'm Karen. I'm a pianist. My favorite thing to do as a musician is to collaborate. I feel so much joy when I learn from others and get to work with them in a way that um, quickly unites us and usually involves a lot of growth and challenge. So I just love that. Um, my career has not really been a series of decisions and um, competitions to lead me to where I am, but I feel I could summarize it by saying that um, it's had a lot to do with my faith, uh, staying close to God and um, seeing how he leads me and hard work, but also um, being a steward of relationships because most of the really exciting projects and opportunities in my life have come through relationships, conversations, um, connections, and um, just sort of very clear natural next steps as a result. So I have done a lot of different kinds of things. Um, I performed uh, solo and collaboratively internationally. Um, I have received an award for my impact as a music educator, Verizon Hall. Um, that's because I really do love teaching. I love mentoring. Um, I love being involved in any kind of work that helps to support artists in their growth. Um, I also really enjoy other things like conducting and composing. I have music that's been on Broadway, but I've also written for choirs and um, collaborated with some really fantastic modern day composers who've influenced me a lot. And um, I also, well, I have three daughters, so we have a lot of music going in our home all the time. And I would say at this stage of my life, especially with the last year being so unusual, the chamber music I've really enjoyed has been with my own family. So that's a new little wrinkle. But um, generally I, I would have to say that most of the things that have happened in my life artistically have surprised me and weren't necessarily things that I was looking to do. So that's been a lot of the fun and adventure of all of it too. So I hope that hope that's enough just to give you a little idea. Wonderful. Um, let's go, we'll go Natalie and then Christina. Sure, hi everyone. I'm really glad to be here. Um, I was at Credo in 2008 and um, yeah, it was just a really enjoyable and pivotal time for me. So it's, it's really nice to be on this side of Credo and um, sort of um, 
being a, in a kind of uh, mentorship position because there were so many um, wonderful mentors that came out of my time there. Um, so I would say, um, yeah, I totally agree with Karen. I love collaboration as well. And I can talk a little bit more about um, how that has played a role in my career, which I very much feel like is still evolving. Um, and so, you know, five years from now, I might come back and um, give you an update maybe of um, where things are headed then. Um, so I, um, let's see, I'm trying to figure out where to begin. I suppose I knew pretty quickly in my studies um, that I probably didn't want a very straightforward career path um, in that I knew I probably wasn't interested in um, going for an orchestra job and kind of doing that um, long term. And so um, I, you know, continued studying. I did my um, bachelor and master's at CIM and then went down to Rice for my doctorate and was always interested in lots of different aspects of um, music and still am. So, um, you know, not just playing in an orchestra, but I loved chamber music and I loved um, the idea of teaching and working with, um, with students who uh, wanted to pursue music in the future, but also non-majors, and that became a really um, large interest for me. Um, and so while I was down in Houston, I started Kinetic, which is a um, conductorless string ensemble. Um, and that was just such a joy to start that and um, play really interesting music, usually un underrepresented uh, music and newly composed music. Um, and that's been a really um, interesting um, sort of uh, repertoire area for me is just um, playing non-standard music. Um, and then I recently joined the faculty at MIT. So I'm up in Boston now, and that was also, you know, something completely different um, that um, seems to make sense because I love working with um, non-majors and people with diverse interests because probably because I find myself being a person with really diverse interests beyond music. Um, and so those are my two, I guess, primary um, gigs right now is um, teaching and uh, running Kinetic. Um, and so I'll probably stop there and um, Hi, everybody. I'm Christy Giles. Um, when I was at Credo, I, my last name was Hendricks, as <laughs> many of you know, or some of you know. Um, so I was one of the first um, Credites, uh, like, what was it, over 20 years ago now. And um, and I think uh, Peter Slope knows this, but it was kind of it was kind of a pivotal moment for me where I um, I was 16 when I went to the camp and I realized um, that music was something that maybe I was interested in, and, um, just to see the perspective that Credo brought to it, of, um, it can be a, a way that you show your faith and, um, lead through your faith, um, through your career. Um, and I guess I sort of came into my career just by kind of, um, following my interests. Um, I never had planned to be a musician. I started piano when I was five and then viola when I was nine and then I was a pure violist for a long time and um, I guess I went through um, my years at Oberlin as a student there and um, then at Rice for my master's thinking I'm a violist and this is what I do and I'm going to get an orchestra job and I, I tried that path of um, just having a straight, straight and narrow music. <laughs> Um, experience and realized it, it actually made me pretty unhappy. Um, I think the happiest I was when I was in school was when I was at Oberlin trying out um, some historical performance, contemporary music, um, and just kind of getting getting messy and doing all kinds of things. Um, and then for years after that, I kind of wandered in the wilderness of orchestra auditions and 
trying to fit into that box and, and finally realizing that um, that wasn't for me. Um, and I, I did, you know, play in, in um, orchestras like the Dallas Opera and um, in Huntsville, Alabama for a while. And I enjoyed my time, but realized, um, yeah, I just wanted to move on and grow. And so um, once I moved to New York um, and uh, started my doctorate at SUNY Stony Brook, um, I sort of got back to my roots of like messing around with things and um, getting back into historical performance. Um, and even, even um, I, I had always considered myself a pure violist. And if any of you are violists, you know what I'm talking about. Like, um, <laughs> I am a violist, I'm not a violet, like, um, and sort of getting out of that, um, out of that mold of trying to define myself by what I was not, but like what I was interested in, what, what I wanted to do. And so I started um, taking lessons with a really great Baroque violinist um, and started playing gigs on Baroque violin and loved that. And then from there, got into modern violin, um, started a couple chamber groups, um, started uh, building a studio of um, students, which is another thing that I had never really considered when I was younger, um, but I realized I really loved teaching and I sort of got back into my piano roots and um, I started teaching piano and realized that I'm actually a really good piano teacher because I had such a wonderful piano teacher growing up. Um, and um, just because I don't have a piano degree doesn't mean I can't um, teach pianists. Um, and I just love watching my students grow and, um, and really develop a love for music. Um, and so, and, and then to go back to what uh, Natalie and Karen were saying about just um, connections are so important really um, your, your colleagues and friends, um, can really inspire you. Um, and, and one of the other things I'll just add before I, I stop babbling on, um, <laughs> I, for the past five years, I've been doing a recording project and it started when I, my, um, my oldest daughter was one. I have three girls like Karen. <laughs> um, and, and it was, I re started recording all the Campagnoli etudes because, or caprices, I'm sorry, for viola because um, I realized there were no recordings out of these. And so it kind of evolved into this, this project that I've really just loved to do. Um, and I, I started it out kind of thinking like, I'll just put a couple of these up there and, um, you know, but it, it, it became like this, this thing that I, um, people have started asking me about and I've become known for. So it's just fun to see um, when you follow your, your interests and it's just this winding path. You don't know where you're going to end up, but oftentimes it, it becomes um, really a neat thing to see how it's going to grow. And I think it is very God-led and it's, uh, it's just entertaining. So. <laughs> Wonderful. That's so awesome. Um, so, so you touched on it a little bit, but um was wondering if you guys could talk about your musical journey, um, kind of starting from when you first started playing um, up until conservatory. Because I know a lot of people that are listening in today and, and joining us, you know, in high school, um, have taken, you know, taken auditions, obviously different than usually uh, they are, um, and are going to be starting conservatory, maybe talking about um, maybe some things uh, during that time that that led you to going into music and, and going into that journey. Um, but whoever would like to start definitely can go for it. Sure, I can jump in. Um, yeah, I forgot to mention, I think that I play violin. <laughs> That's my instrument. Um, so I, um, I grew up in New Zealand. Um, you might detect a little bit of an accent. Um, and so I started learning violin through the Suzuki method when I was four um, and then um, did a lot of chamber music growing up, more than orchestra. In fact, the first time I played a full symphony was as a freshman in college. <laughs> and I remember that first piece was um, the Beethoven Heroica and um, I didn't know how it went. 
I was sight reading and it was just kind of an amazing experience because I, I just knew so little about or orchestra music. Anyway, um, so yeah, grew up in New Zealand and then um, I had an opportunity where I found an opportunity to go to a music festival in my last year in high school. Um, it was in Italy and uh, there were uh, a few professors from the States that invited me to um, audition for their schools. And at the time, I, I don't think I was really thinking about uh, majoring in music. Um, I was definitely going to stay in New Zealand. Um, I kept up all my sciences throughout high school. Um, and so I had sort of thought that I would go into medicine or something sciencey. Um, and so by the time I got back to this festival, back from this festival, it was halfway through my um, last year in high school. And I suddenly, you know, last minute decided that I wanted to go into this route. So I, um, you know, talked to my um, college advisor and, um, you know, she told me that I had to take my, um, my SATs and I didn't know what those were. Um, so I did all of that and, um, yeah, ended up at University of Houston, um, which is where I was for my first two years. Um, and um, yeah, it was during that time that I um, went to Credo. And I can maybe talk a little bit about after Credo later. But um, yeah, I guess, does that answer the question? <laughs> great. Yeah, great. Awesome. Uh, maybe uh, Christina? Or Christy can go next. Um, yeah, so I actually I started viola when I was nine, so I was a bit of a late start on a, on a string instrument um, in school. Um, so if any of you um, started in school in fourth grade, um, <laughs> there's definitely um, you know you can definitely have a very full career even if it seems late compared to maybe what you know your colleagues have done. Um, I I played piano. When I was five, I started piano and I continued that um, all the way through high school. And I feel like that did give me a really good um, musical foundation. And as I mentioned, I went to Credo when I was 16. Um, I played in youth symphony, I'm from Kansas City. So I played in youth symphony um, all throughout high school um, and, and did quite a bit of chamber music. We had a really great um, public school music program um, started taking private lessons when I was in sixth grade. Um, my mom wanted to make sure I was <laughs> serious about another instrument before she, before she indulged that. Um, yeah, so I, I kind of came in with like the, the, the viola chops. I wasn't, I wasn't like technically, um, up to speed, um, from what I saw from other kids, even in youth symphony. And so I felt um, when I first came to Credo, I actually felt very intimidated um, by the level, and um, but I also felt inspired, um, and um, and just seeing that, um, yeah, with a little hard work, like I, I just realized how much I I loved doing music, and I think similar to Natalie, my um, I wasn't sure about a music career, and my parents definitely like wanted me to keep my academics up and. Um, I did a double degree at Oberlin, um, but in the end, I just, I had no other real interest besides, uh, besides doing something with music, so. Well, I had a sort of slow start myself. I started young because my parents found me um, with an upside down backwards postcard improvising and singing and um, I just really, really wanted to play the piano. So they, they found a way to make sure that I could have a lot of music in my life. I also studied the violin and I had a really great teacher and wonderful youth orchestra experiences and tours and I love both instruments. But in high school, I had a real um, crisis of identity where um, well, I had a really serious injury tendonitis so severe doctors thought I would probably never play any instrument again and during that time I had to find out who I was without music and it was a really important turning point in my life because that's where my faith really grew deep roots and became very very practical for me and so in that time 
I found that, yes, I love music and it was such a big part of my life, but it wasn't necessarily who I was. It flowed out from who I am. And so as long as I could stay close to God, whatever he had for me, it would be okay. I didn't have to um, control it and construct it the way that made sense to me anymore. Well, I had a year before I went to college where I just um, kind of went back to the beginning again. I had a teacher who took me back to step one and rebuilt my technique. And it was a really amazing experience because then I was playing again better than I had been before with no pain. So I felt so sure that music was an open door again. I just felt very um, hands off about how this was going to go and just glad to be playing the piano. And so um, I'm really grateful for that background with violin because I love to collaborate with string players so much, singers. I love, I love to collaborate, period. But it's really been great to have that in my life. And um, I also because I've, I love variety and I love people, that's all played into the way that things have unfolded for me. Um, after Oberlin, I was not sure the next best step for me and a very influential teacher recommended that I continue to work at my craft, that maybe for me, I didn't necessarily need to go right on to school, but some of the really great opportunities in front of me would be worth pursuing. Um, so I found teachers, I live in Pennsylvania, I found teachers in New York, Philadelphia, who could help me with my playing and my composing and um, that still kind of continued on and off but it's been an um, important part of my life to keep growing and have accountability from other mentors but the projects and the opportunities have been so exciting and so enjoyable so of course I would have liked to have everything in a nice little neat box too and have um, a nice order to the way everything has gone in my life and it's just not been that way and I'm, I'm really glad it's um, helped me to walk a lot more by faith and um, to control things less. And I also, um, I had started several organizations I never intended to be a part of, um, uh, an art school where I was happy to be a teacher, um, but that has now been bought by university and is thriving and multiplying and it's going way, way past me. That's very exciting. And a choral organization, wasn't planning to do that either, but that's a wonderful thing. I'm not leading it anymore, but it's also continuing on. It's very exciting to see. So I've had a lot of surprises like that where um, my desire to um, influence people and collaborate with them has led to jobs that weren't on my list of things to look for, but have suited me really well and allowed me to continue to be who I am and let these things kind of flow from there and still allowed me to be at the piano, which is where I feel most at home as, a, as an artist. And um, as far as credo, it's been one of the most influential and important parts of my life from the point of meeting Peter Slowick at Oberlin and getting to a company in his studio and finding out we had the faith connection in common and then going to credo and then returning um, for quite a few years as faculty and my husband even being a residential director at one point for two summers and bringing babies with me. Um, it, there, there just has been sort of this like explosion of different circles in my life that happen at Credo. <laughs> and I, I really love the model for living out your faith as an artist. And I think um, you can see that there, that way of thinking and living um, is catching on that there's a lot of exciting things happening around the world right now in that same kind of in that same kind of way that you see modeled and that you experience at Credo. So it's always good to say, I'd like to say thank you, Peter, for what you do, because it is so valuable. Okay, signing off. I would completely agree with that. No, that's amazing and, and, and wonderful to hear how all of these experiences have have impacted your life and your career. It's, it's really, really great. Um, and actually maybe going off of that um, and maybe Karen, you can, start off this again and, and go back and uh, talking about, you know, your faith and your career and your musical journey. Um, you know, maybe talk to uh, students and people that are here um, listening in, maybe, you know, how has your faith, um, you know, what is, how has your faith been helpful in your musical career and your, you know, current profession, uh, professional positions? Um, you know, how has that impacted um, that journey for, for each of you? 
Well, it's completely central. And I go back to that time again where music was a closed door. And I found out that I needed to know who I was with or without music in my life. Um, as far as being able to play it, I know it can still be a part of my life, even if I um, wasn't playing. And so I'm, I'm grateful for that aspect as well. But it has been totally central because one, the things I long to do as an artist, the things I long to express, the excellence I wish to achieve, all of that becomes, I guess the word is opportunity. There's a flow with it when God is working in me. So as I grow and as he makes me more like him, it affects every aspect of who I am as an artist. It's not separate from that. So if I didn't have him, um, I think what I have to say and express would be very, very different. And even the way that the, I would say the confidence I have to do that would be very, very different without my faith. I also, I feel that I would be probably following paths that look very traditional because I would just be too afraid to think outside of that. Not that there's anything wrong with it. I, I think there's just, there's no one right way to be a musician, right? I, um, I would say that for me, it's just been a very, um, exciting journey to learn that I don't have to put limits on this. I don't have to try to look a certain way or follow a certain person, but I can continue to grow and be who I am and contribute from there, which back to the um, question again about how faith plays into this has so much to do with loving people. So it's not just a matter of, you know, using relationships to get performances or, um, get a little extra advantage. It's not a matter of just having students to impart knowledge. It's a matter of loving people and caring for them. And I think that's been modeled so beautifully at Credo. I think about Peter, I know, I know him well, and I've seen this played out before me. Um, Stephen Clapp, another faculty person who had quite an impact on me as well, was known more for his desire to be loving more than being right. And I think that that model that the way of caring for people and doing that, you know, one step at a time is really the model for what it looks like to be a great artist. And so apart from knowing God and living that way, I don't really know what music would be in my life. I think it might be something a lot more oppressive and stressful. And I think it would be something that continually reminds me that I'm not perfect, no matter how hard I work to do things well, I'm not perfect. But knowing what God says about me and how he cares for me, I'm not looking to be perfect. I'm looking to give my best. I'm looking to do things with excellence, but I'm not, I'm not, you know, kind of pressed down by that nonstop pressure. And so I don't think I could be an artist and be able to be expressive and creative if I was living with that constant oppression. I just don't know how I could do that. Wonderful. No, that's, that's amazing. Amazing thing. Um, maybe Nat, yeah, Natalie or, or Christy, go ahead and maybe talk about maybe your faith journey as well through music and, and your career and, you know, all of that kind of what Karen was talking about. Sure. So um, I guess I can talk about my faith um, in, in that it, it, you know, grew as I was growing as a musician. Um, I left home when I was 18 um, to a country very far from home. And so it was kind of a scary time to be on my own and, uh, you know, both physically, but also spiritually on my own and also um, learning a lot of music. Um, and so it was it wasn't always uh straightforward you know there were there were ups and downs and there still are um but i think um you know this question of your identity as a musician is i think something that all musicians struggle with um and a lot of this journey of um, being a student and now being a teacher is understanding that um you're more than just a musician. Um, and, you know, having played music for so long, it's easy to think like, 
that that's all I do. You know, that's what I'm known for. I'm a violinist and um, that's what people value me for. Um, but more and more, I think it's important to, uh, you know, remind ourselves that first and foremost, we are, um, you know, adopted children of God. And that should be um, the most important thing. And then also we're musicians, also we play music. Um, and so I think um, learning that has, uh, like Karen said, helped to um, remove that pressure to some degree. Um, one, one thing that I haven't mentioned is that um, throughout my time as a student, I did have a lot of injuries as well, and also in high school. Um, and, you know, when I got to conservatory to CIM, that was a really hard time for me because I suddenly, you know, I went from a state school to being in a conservatory and I saw, saw that these um, students were practicing hours and hours and hours. And I wasn't in the habit of practicing hours and hours and hours. And also I had, a, had um, I was injury prone. So there was a lot of pressure to, um, for me to think, okay, I need to be practicing as much as the person next to me in that practice room. Um, but over time, you know, over lots of learning and, um, and praying and, and all of that stuff, I realized that no, you know, uh, you know, four hours might be great for this person, but that's not for me. And um, it was a really hard process because um, I was and continue to be quite um, prone to comparison. Like, okay, what is that person doing? Maybe I should be doing that as well. But at some point I kind of let that go. And, um, you know, if one hour is great for today, then that's great. And if I don't practice tomorrow, that's totally fine too. And so even now as a, you know, a professional musician and teacher, I will go um, some days without practicing and that's totally fine. Um, and so that's been part of it, um, understanding my faith and also um, who I am as a musician. Um, all of that has been really tied together. I love I love hearing both of your stories about your faith and your music. It's very, it's it's really um, so interesting and enlightening to hear. Um, and and it, just to piggyback off of what Natalie was saying for a minute, um, now as a mom of three, and the youngest one is a toddler that's like a human hurricane, just destroying the house all the time. <laughs> I can say that I go for a week or two without practicing and I still know how to play the, the violin and the viola and the piano. <laughs> so um, I think sometimes when we're young um, and we, um, we see what we, what we can be, what other people are um, in their skill level, we think that, well, the, if I just do it more, if I, if I drive myself harder, um, then I'll be that way. And um, no, it's really um, it's really about discovering yourself and and having God help you help you do that. And um, just just looking back at my life, like the the doors that were opened and the doors that were closed for me, um, kind of it it made this. Um, you know, I I talked about how I tried to fit myself into a box. And God just kept saying, sorry, <laughs> like, this is not for you. <laughs> like, you don't like to audition for orchestras. We know, like, I would get so tense. I would um, practice so many hours a day. And I just, um, what I needed was variety. I needed um, lots of, I needed to play different instruments to find my own voice. Um, I needed to learn how to relax. And the only way to do that was to learn how to have fun, which took me a, a, actually a long time to do as a musician, to learn how to like sit down with other um, musicians and just read through chamber music. Um, that was a really hard thing for me to do at first because um, I was so nervous about making a mistake. And um, yeah, to go, um, to go back um, to what Karen was saying about just you know, being afraid of, um, of being perfect and um, 
that's something that um, I, I think that when I when I first came to Credo, that was the probably the first time that I felt like, okay, like being perfect is not the goal here. It's about connecting with God and how can we how can we connect with God through music and um, and as as a person of faith, I've always felt like I connected with God best through music. Um, and I've always been most comfortable in church when I'm singing or when I'm playing in worship um, or when I'm involved in some way, because I think just as a as a performer, even though I get um, anxiety and <laughs> I used to get horrible, um, you know, stage fright, it, it's much better now. But um, I still felt like somehow comfortable being up there and and playing or, you know, as as a worshiper. Um, one of the things I really loved about um, when I first came to Credo was the morning sings <laughs> and just opening that um, the day with um, with a hymn and just, you know, using that time to not think about what do I need to do? How am I going to get better at my craft? But how am I going to honor God today? And um, when we have that perspective right, then then we're able to honor God many more times with our with our music and, and with our lives than than um, we would otherwise. Um, and now, as a um, as a mom, and I, I teach my kids um, violin and piano, um, my two older ones, and uh, and we homeschool as well. So that's like a, become another dimension um, where it's like I I have put on like. I consider that equally important to my my career, um, and just seeing how they, um, you know, we we devote a little bit of time every day to reading the Bible and um, learning some hymns. Now that we can't be in church and and things like that, but um, just how they they really latch on to that connection with God, even at such an early age. They're six and four, and so it's it's really neat to to see that um in a in a different perspective now as a parent can i piggyback on something there um similar situation with the homeschooling also in the mix i have seen that god has shown me so many different times that these are not different roles or different hats that i wear like i'm a pianist or i'm a teacher or i'm a mom or fill in the blank with anything that you have in your life it's that he's shown me that i'm his child and he loves me. And so whatever thing I'm doing at the moment, I can do that with great love to glorify him. And if it's something very menial and invisible or something very um, public on a stage, it's all important. And so really there was a moment in my life where I was having another kind of crisis of identity. Well, should I leave my music to the side for a while? How can I really um, invest in these tiny little children who need a lot. And actually through a gift of a piano, God answered a lot of my prayers all at once by showing me, it wasn't that I was supposed to know what my roles were. It was, I was supposed to, again, know who I am in him and whatever things he had for me to do day to day, month to month, year to year. And that balance is ever changing and um, fluctuating from year to year that I could just be confident in him and then do whatever was in front of me with love and excellence. And it's so joyful because like Christy said, it is, um, there are other things in my life that are very significant as well as music, but they contribute to my, to my musical growth too. And I'll just say one more thing about that as far as performance nerves. That was a very, very big issue for me after my injury. When I got to Oberlin, I was extremely stressed about sharing in front of anybody. I just felt so new to my instrument again. And I, I really, really went through a hard time with that. But it's amazing how becoming a mom has actually changed a lot of that for me. Because one time with the Credo Trio, we were on tour, we were in California and I had a little tiny four month old with me. <laughs> and somehow playing the concert still felt so important, but it couldn't overpower me because I had this little tiny person I was responsible, taking care of her, handing her off well to this babysitter. And when I walked on stage to play, I remember thinking, this is so different now the way I look at performing. It's as important and special to me as ever, but I just can't, I, I don't have the same kind of stress about it 
that I used to. And I'm not sure how else I would have learned that if I hadn't become a mom. I, I can't even begin to imagine, but that's how it was for me. And I learned that um, I can't just get there by practicing either. There are things I have to learn in my in my soul and my spiritual walk that will help me as an artist. And that one really did. <laughs> Yeah, oh, that's yeah, that's so beautiful. And um, I don't know if I mentioned this, Natalie, when we first started, but I went to CIM as well. And yeah, it can be hard when you you know you're in that kind of environment. And I know um, at least one other person here today is going to be starting conservatory, and it can be it can be difficult. And um, but yeah, you're more to your you know you're more than just like yeah, the amount of hours you practice, and it's you know a lot of things, right? It's practicing, it's listening, it's playing with others, and. Um, especially that's something we've not had a lot of the past years is sharing with other people. So, um, you know, wonderful, great stories. Um, uh, maybe uh, we could talk about um, uh, kind of some, some cool stories. Maybe if there's a memorable moment in your career so far um, that you had or the most interesting gig you've ever done. Um, Kind of have some 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 cool, funny, interesting stories from uh, what you guys have done. Maybe we'll go Christy, Natalie, Karen. Um, if anything comes to your mind, <laughs> I, I just um, when I think back over my career and the the things that I've done. I mean, obviously, it's, it's not far from over, but um, I would say right now, it's kind of um, because of the pandemic, I feel like it's a little bit on pause. I still have students, I still have my kids that I'm teaching, and I have my first gig um, tomorrow <laughs> in like a year and a half, and it, I've never felt so excited <laughs> to play a gig. I, I have a new appreciation um, for that, but um, that's just, a, and, and my second vaccine. So it's just kind of, it's gonna be like a wild and crazy day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, I just think about like some of the amazing travel I've had and just some of the amazing friends that I've met. And, um, you know, a lot of these people, I haven't talked to them in years. Um, like I'm thinking, Ashley, we haven't seen each other in what has it been 20 years, but I feel like we saw each other you know, last week or something now seeing you again. And it's just, uh, it's just so, it's so neat to make all those connections. Um, and I, I'd say one of my favorite, um, uh, two of my favorite experiences. So, um, and they were both very different. Um, one was uh, I did, I was playing in this orchestra called Arcos, which doesn't exist anymore, but it was a, it was a chamber orchestra. We did like Mozart and we did um, new music and we did this, amazing tour to Germany in June. So it was um, almost the summer solstice. And um, and so it would get dark at like, you know, 10 at night. And it was, it was so beautiful. Um, there was like, there were asparagus festivals going on. Um, I had my birthday there and just like all these amazing places that we, we played. And we went to Vienna, we went to Salzburg, we went to um, Dresden and played um, Shostakovich's, um, which um, quartet is that? But it was the first, um, like, I'd say real chamber piece that I played at, at Credo, actually the one that um, is about the um, Holocaust. Um, and so um, that was an amazing experience, but just getting to see so many historic places. And um, we went to Berlin, um, saw the Berlin Wall. Um, and so like, amazing musical experiences, but also just like amazing, like educational <laughs> experiences and just um, memories, food. Um, uh, but then, um, and then the other amazing travel experience I had was um, my husband and I, um, so he, he played in a, um, in a he, he's a violinist and he went to Oberlin as well. That's where we met. Um, uh, he was playing in a um, non-professional orchestra in the city and we did a tour of China together. So I actually played violin for that. That was actually one of the reasons I started playing violin was someone asked me, can you play violin for a gig? And I was like, yes, I can't. So I spent like a month. <laughs> one of the, one of the things I've learned from my, my career is like, sometimes you just have to say yes and then figure out how to do it. I mean, you know, within reason, but 
Um, and so anyway, so I played violin on this gig and um, we saw some amazing places in China. It was a brutal tour because sometimes we were traveling at night on a bus or something like that. Um, I got food poisoning. There were some, there were some rough things about it. Um, but we, we were almost like up in, um, we were very close to North Korea at one point. We went all the way from like the north of China to the south of China and saw some places that um, like very few Westerners actually go. And so what was also interesting was being looked at from a, um, from a, a perspective of like, I'm, I'm the odd one here. Like they think I'm interesting because they've, they've never seen a Westerner in person. And so just to have that experience um, was also really neat, but just to really see the, the culture that I don't think if I had gone to China just as a tourist, I don't think I would have seen those corners of the country. Um, and so that was um, very, very interesting too. Yeah, I think one of the best things about being a musician and studying music is, um, like Christina said, the, the awesome places that you can travel. And so, yeah, while you're young, I would encourage you to sign up for those music festivals and, and all those things where you get to go to beautiful places. Um, one of my favorite um, places that I went was uh, the UK. Um, I was very excited when the first time I went because I'd never been to, I, I had never been to the UK before, um, but I went to the Britain Pierce um, program, um, which is in England. Um, I went there maybe three or four times. Um, and then um, the last time I had gone over to the UK was for a little tour. Um, it's kind of funny how this came about, but this was the year that the Commonwealth Games was happening in Glasgow and um, the Scottish Ensemble was looking to put together this sort of um, Commonwealth um, project where they had different people from different Commonwealth countries participate and um, I'm sure they were trying to think of any musicians they knew from New Zealand. I mean, there are some great musicians from New Zealand, but there aren't that many of us. And so somehow I got the call to do that. And um, we, did a, we did a little tour from um, Edinburgh and um, went down and ended up in Alborough, which is where the Britain Pierce um, Festival takes place. So that was really beautiful, um, just traveling by train. And um, yeah, that was, that was a lot of fun. But I did want to mention the, the weirdest gig I've ever done um, to maybe um, talk about how sometimes gigs aren't, not every gig that you do is going to be enjoyable and sometimes you just have to do it and that's totally fine. Um, so when I was in Houston, um, I you know was in school, but I also needed to work and take gigs. And um, there was one wedding that I played where, um, there were eight, I think there were eight violinists or a combination of violinists and violists. And we had to play um, on loop um, three, uh, three songs um, memorized and we all had to dress in tuxes. And so I remember <laughs> um, going, you know, the day before to men's warehouse or whatever to pick up my tux and it was like a white tux or something like that. And <laughs> we stood, um, in a row while the guests walked in and walked past us. And I was just thinking, wow, this is kind of terrible, but that's okay. Um, hopefully the next gig I do will be much, much more pleasing than this. Um, but those will definitely happen. And um, I have driven, you know, long distances to uh, get a paycheck and all of that is totally, totally part of it as well. And, um, you know, um, like Christina and Karen said, um, there's so much in our musical journey that isn't straightforward. And some of that involves, you know, exploring different things that we um, enjoy and some things that we don't enjoy. And then we sort of find our way through that. So. I have also enjoyed travel, love going to other places, but I'll talk instead about um, sort of the last thing I ever expected to be involved in, which was um, 
helping to write music for a show on Broadway. Not an area that I knew very much about. In fact, to some of my classical friends, they were sort of worried about me, like, what are you getting yourself into? But it came through a relationship, as I said earlier, um, that's how things have, have, that's how I've experienced um, the unfolding of these projects and adventures. And it was actually a project where I thought I was interviewing somebody to maybe teach at a school I was starting when it turned out he was writing a show on Broadway and thought he needed me to help him. And so it was a very wild ride um, working with someone who had this vision and um, script to bring to Broadway to tell the story of the author of Amazing Grace and his life and his encounter with God. Um, it turned out that even some music I had written in high school ended up in the show that I hadn't even written for the show. And there were a lot of um, interesting, um, how to say this, well, just experiences of helping to get the show to Broadway, um, meeting with investors, playing all kinds of unusual um, previews and uh, workshops in New York City. It was just a fascinating experience. And then when it finally um, went first to Connecticut, then to Chicago, and then to Broadway, being there, sitting in the theater, especially in New York City uh, for opening night, and thinking to myself, I never, I never pictured this. I never knew that this was going to be part of my journey. And for all the um, hard work involved, at the same time, there was just this continued sense of God is working. And so I was just so excited to be a part of it. And I, I wasn't just as a pianist, let's say, or a composer. I had a lot of um, unusual jobs. For example, listening to the author sing his ideas into my ear fully formed ideas down to the 16th rest exactly where he wanted it and having to transcribe it and um, come up with arrangements that went with his original idea, even though he was not even a musician. It was just, it, it involved me having to stretch and grow in brand new ways. And I really enjoyed it. It was, it was very fun and exciting to see God at work. And I think that's what fuels me. When I see him working, I just want to jump in with all my heart, even if I've got lots of reservations and feel very inadequate, which I do most of the time, I, I feel very confident because I see him opening the way and leading me. So that was quite an adventure. That's so cool. Awesome. Well, um, I think since we're getting kind of near the end of our time, um, kind of open up for if anyone has any questions. It's been such an amazing discussion and um, any questions any of you have, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, that way we can uh, get those answered for you. Um, maybe while we're uh, leaving everyone time to do that, um, have a couple kind of lightning round, a couple quick questions that don't take too long to answer. Um, and we'll go uh, just again, because that, that's how it's shown up on my screen, uh, screen. Karen, Natalie, and then Christy, um, you can all just kind of answer after each other. Um, so we'll, we'll go kind of off of what Karen's talking about. So first question, um, do any of you have a favorite Broadway musical or like any Broadway music or things like that? Show music. <laughs> That's a little tricky to answer. I really should say Amazing Grace. I love Amazing Grace. But <laughs> True. Music by Andrew Lloyd Webber and um, well, many others. But I have to say um, Les Mis is a hard one to top. I especially love that musical. I was a little late on this trend, but I recently watched Hamilton and I love it. <laughs> so that's my favorite right now. Also, I've never been to Broadway, so I've never watched a show on Broadway. So that's on my list once the pandemic is over. Um, I kind of love whatever I have recently listened to. <laughs> Hamilton is uh, the second most recent, but right now I'm, we're watching Mary Poppins with my kids. And so that's bringing back a lot of uh, great childhood memories. Um, and it's just fun to see them laugh at all the same things that um, I love, so. <laughs> that's so sweet. Um, uh, where in the world would you like to perform that you haven't been to yet? Perform, visit, where have you not been that you'd like to be? I don't have a list like that. I do, 
I do love to be in historic halls that like just to feel the connection to history and you know famous artists famous performances so really any would be just fine with me. Maybe not necessarily to perform, but I really want to go to Japan. Um, and that's been, um, yeah, that's been on my list for a little while. So whenever international travel is okay, that's, that's where I'll go. Besides New Zealand, of course. Um, I always had a fascination with the Mi Middle East and um, Middle Eastern music. And um, I love like Turkish food. Um, so I think that would definitely be on my list, maybe just as a place to go to learn how, I mean, the music there is like mind blowing and um, the amount of different tones they have in their music. Uh, so maybe even just to be a student. <laughs> awesome. And we have a couple questions now and we'll kind of, uh, we'll start with this one, also kind of a lightning round type question. What are each of your favorite hymns? or him. Sometimes it's hard to choose one. Hard to choose. I have to say uh, the title track of my first CD comes from my favorite hymn. It's um, Take My Life and Let It Be. There's this verse that says, take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love. And we talk about impulses in piano playing all the time. And I love that picture of finding the rhythm and the way to move according to his love. I just think it's so beautiful. This is a hard question, but um, one of them that comes to mind is um, In Christ Alone by the Gettys. I really love that one. I always loved singing um, The Lord Bless You and Keep You in the morning at Credo. It's just, it just brings back so many great memories that um, I have so many favorite hymns that um, it's kind of like I can't even think of them unless I hear them. <laughs> But there, it's it's wonderful music. So, a, a Credo classic, um, and Elizabeth. Yeah, we'll get to your question. We have just uh, a couple other kind of quick questions. Um, what is your favorite style to compose in? It changes by the day. I have a piece I've been writing during COVID that's almost finished, and it's sort of more um, reflective and free, but I do love to arrange hymns and there's a certain kind of, um, you know, sound that flows easily for me when I play hymn arrangements. Peter knows because he's been a great sport to try out many of them. <laughs> so I tend to feel very happy playing that way. But um, the more the merrier, the more variety, the better. Well, I don't compose. <laughs> um, but I do like playing other people's compositions um, and all kinds. Um, I also have to say I've dreamt of, comp like literally dreamt of composing, but never tried my hand in it. And I feel like probably all of us as musicians have it in us to, to do it. Um, but um, it sometimes seems pretty daunting. So I hope someday when I have more time. I, I would probably start with like um, folk music or something, something like that, because I love um, simple tunes. Awesome. Um, and then from Julia, she has two quick questions. Um, what's your favorite genre of non-classical music? And uh, have you named your instruments? I'm not sure how to choose. I do I just, it really depends on the moment. I, I love to listen to jazz when I'm cooking. I know that's considered, you know, part of the classical canon. So outside of it, I don't know, my, my kids and I love to listen to music from other cultures. It, I just couldn't possibly choose, I'm so sorry. But I also can say that I have not named my instruments. Maybe I should. I also have not named my instrument. Um, and I'm not sure this is a hard question about genre. Um, I think um, during my, you know, work, working hours, I'm listening to so much music and sort of researching and 
finding programs and things like that, that, that in my off time, I don't spend a lot of time looking for music to listen to for leisure. Um, so often if there's something in the background, it's, it's my husband that chooses it and I'm happy to, to listen to whatever that is. Um, when I was growing up, I was, I was a child of the 90s, so I loved um, alternative rock from the 90s. <laughs> Um, but also I love um, folk music, bluegrass, um, like Irish um, fiddle tunes, things like that. Um, and one artist that I've really gotten into lately who's actually an Oberlin alum is Rhiannon Giddens. Um, Peter, you probably know of her. And yeah, um, she's amazing. And um, she just kind of embodies what I think of like sort of a... Um, she's got her hands and she plays... Um, a banjo that has got strings. Um, she plays violin, she plays viola. She's an she was actually an opera singer when she was at Oberlin. So she's just like, um, just this like looming figure of like, I wanna be like that someday. <laughs> um, I don't name my instruments, although I probably should because I think currently in our house, there's like at least eight. So if they had names, it would probably be easier to distinguish them. <laughs> That's so funny. Um, all right, so I think we'll wrap up with uh, Elizabeth's question. Um, and her question is, what advice do you have to seniors in high school that are figuring out if music is the path to take to go towards um, in college and beyond? Really great question. Really great question. Um, two things I'd like to share. One, somebody said this to me. They said, if there's anything else that you're really passionate about and you would rather do, do that. And then if there isn't, and really it's music is your passion, then that's what you should do. It's almost like you have to, because it's so much, um, it's just such an expression of who you are as a person. For me, I couldn't have made that decision. Um, I was on the fence between science and music until my injury. And then I realized when music was going away that it wasn't just something that I loved. It was really what I wanted to do more than anything else. But I didn't know that I could make that decision if I didn't have God leading me, if I couldn't ask him everything and see him open that path for me. So besides that thing about passion for me, it was really having God to direct my steps one at a time. And without that, I, I would have been so confused about how to take that next step after high school. Yeah, I would say um, it's totally okay if you're not sure. And if you have lots of interests, that's that's really fun and that's really great. And um, I think like maybe Karen talked about earlier, you know, other things that you're interested in or are doing um, helps you be a better musician. Um, and so there are, there are a lot of programs um, at uh, schools in the country that have you know, double degrees, or even if you decide not to major in music, there's so much opportunity to take music courses. I teach at MIT, so most of the students in, in our music programs are double majoring it in, um, you know, science or um, physics or, you know, all kinds of things. And then they do music on the side. Some of them, when they graduate, they decide to switch and do music um, as their master's program or um, we've had, um, yeah, um, people graduate and go on to join orchestras. So um, I wouldn't say, I, I would say the there's still lots of possibility once you get to college. It's not, you know, just one straightforward path once you get, once you're a freshman. I will say one of the greatest things I ever heard when I, early in my teaching career was one of my colleagues describing music as having a semi-permeable membrane around it you can always get out of music, but it's hard to get back in. So you know, keeping music being a part of your life and then just listening to what people say and where God takes that is a very interesting thing. Don't give up your music though. Yeah, and, and just um, to kind of piggyback on, on what everybody has been saying, it's, it's also, it's, it's not all or nothing, right? Um, I know people that have um, gotten a bio, like a biology or like 
done pre-med and then they they decided to go into music and had a very successful music career um and people that have gone the other way um and they went to juilliard they did the whole masters and everything and then they became a lawyer in fact there's two um i have two in-laws um in my family um that have that have gone that path so um you know and you can still play and you can still love it in fact my husband um was a music major at Oberlin and then um, became an engineer and he still plays and we play together. And so, um, you know, it's, it's fluid and um, you should just pursue the, the path that, that seems right to you at, at the time that you're looking at it. Really awesome. Well, thank you so much everyone for being here, especially for our uh, fireside panels it was a wonderful discussion. It was so great hearing all of your stories and um, we appreciate everyone, both Credo and Credo Club for coming and hope you all have a great night. Thanks so much.